Welcome again to our frequent podcast called Wear Many Hats, inspired by Ethan Hawkey. Throughout the year, I, David Punter, the Business Development Director for Hawkey Cleaning and Support Services, shall be interviewing prominent facilities management procurement subject matter experts across a range of industry market sectors. It's these people with their wealth of knowledge and experience that will inspire the next generation of young professionals. Our objective is to share our guests' stories and experiences to help motivate, engage and inspire others into the industry. Through Wear Many Hats podcast, we hope our listeners will gain new perspectives, insights and learn about strategies to develop their careers in the facilities management procurement business. It gives me great pleasure to introduce James Townsend, CEO of Contour. And thank you, James, for uh, taking the seat today. And uh, without uh, further ado, uh, that sort of brings me to my next uh, set of questions. Um, James, just want to kind of get an understanding a little bit about your um, journey. Uh, we're not sort of going back to the Jurassic period, but your journey um, in, in sort of facilities management and your career journey. Sure. Uh, well, I started when I was 17, leaving school. Uh, with some fairly basic kind of GCSEs and, and the first kind of year of A-levels thinking this isn't really for me uh, and ended up working for a local estate agent down in Suffolk. Um, okay. That was my kind of first foray, if you like, into sort of the real estate world. Realised probably after about six months of doing sort of lettings and, and various house sales that my boss thought I was capable of a little bit more uh, and he said, look, you should go and study to be a chartered surveyor and I said, okay. what's that? And that was the kind of first real. Where, kind of whereabouts in Suffolk was that? Uh, in Ipswich, where I'm okay. kind of born and born and raised. So that's where I'm originally from. Okay, so not just a small town; it's a, a reasonable size. Yeah, still, still small town mentality, perhaps. Though. Okay, and you went into becoming a surveyor. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I went basically through clearing, which is kind of something where failed kind of A-level students ultimately go to find the last few university places that exist and actually found there was one in Chelmsford, obviously not too far away from, from Suffolk itself, doing okay. real estate management. So that was the, the degree that I undertook, went and did that for three years. And, and the kind of deal that I had with the principal, if you like, of, of the university was if you can pass the first year, we'll let you stay on and do the second year. And then if you do that, we'll let you do the third year. Here we are sort of sitting with a first class honours degree and a, and a bunch of kind of certificates from the RCS over the last sort of 10 years of kind of excellence within the industry. So hopefully I've found my passion. So a first class degree? Yes. Yep. Excellent. You've negotiated that well. <laughs> it's amazing who you pay. <laughs> and so after that, what, what happened then? Uh, from there, I uh, worked briefly at a chartered surveyors in Framlingham in Suffolk, again, yeah. sort of focusing more on agricultural uh, sales, farmland, but realized pretty quickly that I had a bit of an itching to come to London and, and kind of explore the big bad city. Um, so I then applied to various graduate rotation routes uh, and had two offers, one from a company called Kinney Green and another one called Matthews & Goodman. Okay. Matthews & Goodman, are the oldest surveying firm in the UK, um, and I ended up deciding to go there, not particularly for any other reason other than they were based on Piccadilly Circus, and I thought that that was the centre of the universe and, and started there in their valuation department. So London, the streets were paved with gold, Dick Whittington story, really. <laughs> exactly that. Yep, this is sort of back in 2007. Okay, and then where did you progress from there, James? So I did uh, valuation for, for two years. I did a rotation into property management and, and facilities management within that business, looking after central London assets, um, and found myself ultimately, because of uh, the sort of downturn in the market, stuck in that team doing uh, real estate management for, for landowners, um, I then ultimately wanted a company car. I wanted some more money, and the only way I was going to get that was by moving. So I ended up moving to a company called Helix, um, who do a lot of property management, yeah. um, a lot of asset management on behalf of landlords who were recently bought by Heinz and now look after a number of their assets as well. And how long were you with Helix? I was actually only there about 12 months, 12 to 18 months. Okay. Um, and I got to a position where I felt there were more opportunities to kind of work within a bigger firm. I hadn't done that. I'd done the sort of small and medium-sized firms um, and wanted an opportunity to go and kind of do the big CBRE, DTZ route at that point mm -hmm. and, and kind of get that broader experience to then come back and kind of focus in on one particular profession. Okay, so you jumped to uh, D, um, DTZ. 
I did, yeah, DTZ for four months, uh, for four months uh, which you can kind of see how the CV is starting to look at this point. Well, why, why does this guy keep jumping around and doing these things? Um, to be honest with you, at that point in time, we'd obviously come through this kind of financial crisis. They'd made a lot of redundancies. There was still a lot of heads down. It felt a little bit like working for a local authority, trying to get through decisions, trying to be entrepreneurial just wasn't possible. Okay, and this was the, around about the 2000 and... 2010, 11 10, time, okay, right. yeah, something along those lines. Mm. And, and I just felt, you, when, you know when you walk in somewhere, it just doesn't feel right. And that was one of those places where it just didn't quite sit comfortably. Mm. Did it for four months, decided it wasn't for me, and ended up transitioning straight over to CBRE down the road. And I thought, to another big green monster. is this going to be exactly the same? And in fairness to them, it was completely different. Okay. Um, so I ended up working there for three and a half years. Again, started in the central London property management team, working on a lot of asset management strategy, a lot of facilities management, managing the on-site staff within various central London assets. So on facilities management, was it the soft services or hard services or both? A little bit of both. Okay. A little bit of both and, and procuring the contracts and, and being involved in that process alongside a day-to-day um, sort of head of management within the building itself. Um, we then worked with all of the property accountants as well to kind of manage those contracts and run service charges and everything else. But I kind of noticed that after a little bit of time of working in that particular market, mm-hmm. my interest really lied in sort of the brokerage side of it and dealing with the tenants and kind of ultimately being their advisor rather than being the firefighter. Okay. And I sat in the property management team. Your inbox kept filling up. There was always someone who had got a broken toilet. There was always something that needed replacing. And I just felt the weight of it sitting on top of me. And I didn't feel like I was adding value. And I felt like okay. I could do more. So you wanted to move away from a slightly operational side and more client engagement. Exactly that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so I then moved from that team probably after about a year to work in the tenant rep team at CBRE. So working with predominantly US entrance into the market. So Google, Netflix, Hootsuite, DocuSign, all of these kind of companies that are now becoming mainstream things that we use in our day-to-day life were very small companies at that point. Mm -hmm. I was helping them find their first UK office. Um, And really, they really engaged with you because they looked to you to advise them on what was happening in the market. How much should they be paying for space? What does good look like? Okay. Um, And then move through that kind of journey as they scale to find suitable options for them as they grow. I mean, you were with CBRE uh, a, a length of time, about three and a half years, um, and now you've set up your own um, smaller company, but uh, as, a, as a founder of that company. Um, what, what did you learn from CBRE? I don't want to put a downer on to our listeners that may want to go down the CBRE and the Cushman and Wakefield type of route. Um, did you learn something from your experience there? I think there's an element of uh, people management. You've okay. always got someone above you and you've got people below you and it's kind of transitioning that message from, from top to bottom. Uh, it's it's a sort of greasy pole that you're constantly trying to, to move your way through, but also just process the right way to do things. You know, there are no shortcuts in those in, in, in those sort of organizations. You need to be you're doing the right thing, putting your face in the right place. You need to be doing the extracurricular stuff. It's not just about the day-to-day job. And, of course, lots of politics. Indeed. Yeah. So what inspired you um, – uh, to pursue a career in, in sort of property facilities management. I mean, obviously, way back, someone you decided to to, to say to you to do a, 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 a chartered surveyor role and stuff, but there must have been a spark there. Yeah, I think there's always been a general interest in the built environment. It's something that we constantly interact with. It's a little bit, in my head when I looked at it, very much like a hairdresser. And it sounds like a really bad example, but people are always going to need haircuts. People are always going to need funeral services. People are generally looking for you know, one of those kind of key things of security and comfort and shelter. We're always going to need real estate in some way. So but you were brought up in a very rural environment. I was, yeah. yeah. But I had Farmland, yeah, exactly. fields, yeah. sheep. Everything was utilized around us. And I think okay. it's, it's not dissimilar when we look at you know, London. It's just the way it's consumed is different to, to farmland. Okay. Um, and so tell me, uh, I, I believe that you've had sort of six years, you, you've been a bit involved in racing and stuff. You've had a little bit of a hiatus. What happened there? Yeah, I, I think, well, I turned 30 uh, seven years ago and I'd always had a passion for for racing. It was something I used to go and watch with my father when I was when I was a boy. I used to go to Brands Hatch and watch the touring cars, and, and I always thought, look, this is mega. I love the sights, the smell, the sound of the whole thing, but 
I want to be the one driving. I don't want to be the one watching. And it, Bit of a thrill seeker then. Yeah, to an extent. I think it was a release from work, to be perfectly honest with you. And it's something I've always wanted to do. But I think we all know that it's quite prohibitive in terms of cost. Um, and I was fortunate enough to build our business to help where it is now to, to help with relationships from a sponsorship point of view, from a personal financial perspective, have a little bit more free cash to mm. put into this. And, and it really felt like one of the only opportunities you get to put your mobile phone away and disappear for a weekend. You can't have your phone with you in the car. Probably not. Been getting, well, you, you could if you're driving, but when you're racing, it's a slightly different kind of mindset. And uh, it, yeah, it's my way of turning off. It's it's quite a stressful weekend. Uh, from but was the period of stress uh, brought on by being with the larger organization of CBRE that you decided to that this was a hobby, or was it because you liked the adrenaline rush? Or Well, I, I wasn't at CBRE when I started doing it, so it would be difficult for me to say. I think the one thing I would say about working for a bigger organization rather than your own business is you don't carry that home with you. You're diligent. You do care. Mm. You want to make sure that both your brand individually is well well regarded as well as the brand you're representing but you never carry that same pride and care that you'll probably answer the phone at 10 o'clock if one of your clients called you you might just put it in the drawer and okay. pick it up the next morning i can't do that now. so the racing is a business now not just a hobby passion yeah yeah for, okay. for me yeah very much so we use it for client entertainment we use it for hosting events um and we use it for publicizing other people's brands and their messages and, and what they want to achieve okay and then after that, you then set up Contour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my co-founder Luke and I uh, were both working at CBRE together. Okay. Luke predominantly working with landlords, advising them on their real estate strategy. I was on the tenant rep side, as we kind of talked about, and we were often coming together and saying, "I've got an amazing tenant for your your landlord space," and he's saying, "Well, I've got an empty space. I don't know what to do with. How do we how do we get it gone?" Um, and we recognised pretty quickly that. Occupiers in the tech and creative industries are predominantly underserved by professional services. So okay. Accountants, law firms, surveyors, they're overlooked. They don't want to pay the minimum fees that a CBRE would expect, so they often get put to the bottom of the pile. There's often a disconnect between how they approach uh, the client. So if you're suited and booted and you go and see a tech startup, you're never going to engage in the right way. So we took the view that there was an opportunity to leave CBRE, set up on our own and create what is now Contour, but work with those occupiers at the early stages of their growth and the hope that they would go through rounds of funding, start to grow their business, be successful. And then when they do need 10, 15, 20,000 square feet, we wouldn't have to go and pitch against the CB Cushman JLL because we already had that relationship at C-suite level. Mm -hmm. you know, fast forward nine and a half years, we now have a bunch of occupiers who are some of the biggest in the market here in london and we're still representing them and, and doing work with them globally not just here so turning over uh turning over this year probably five million okay yeah and obviously i mean you've been going for nine nine odd years um and actually during some very tough times as a, a bit uh, <laughs> I mean, I say that lightly, but uh, you, you, I, the, for the listeners, uh, uh, my uh, uh, James is smiling across the table here. Um, it was a very tough time and stuff. Has that been a challenge on your, uh, you know, we're going it alone business? Yeah, hu hugely. I think we were really fortunate to pick up a major client very early on. And okay. they paid us a retainer as well as paying us success fees on acquiring space for them. So that helped bankroll our, our kind of cash flow, our business for the first six to 12 months. We then grew the business from the two of us with a laptop and a mobile phone to probably about 10. Uh, that was probably 2016, 2017. Okay. We then went into 2020 carrying 25, 26 people with an office in New York and in London in a market where one minute we're booming, we've done 2 million quid in our first quarter thinking mm. we're going to be on our best year ever to suddenly nobody wants an office. Correct. Nobody, nobody understands why you would take an office. So we had no inquiries for six months, nothing. So, okay. So, um, so did you lay staff off or obviously you furloughed staff and we, things we, like we that? We furloughed. We let two or three go at the beginning of the process before the furlough scheme became apparent. Okay. We knew that we couldn't possibly carry those people, but we also thought there was an opportunity to move them elsewhere before this hit. So you could kind of see the waves happening, and we were fortunate to put those, those people into actually our clients' businesses. And we've now actually brought one of them back into okay. the business, and the other two are our clients at our clients. So it's worked out really well from that point of view. You never okay. want to lay off people. It's never something I set out doing. When I was at Matthews and Goodman, we went into that first 
2008, 2009 cycle, and they let probably half of the graduates who'd come in go in one afternoon. And I was one of the fortunate ones to stay. Mm. And you think, well, surely it's worse to be made redundant. It is, but there's also a part of you that then feels the guilt that you're the one left. Uh, so having been through that process myself... Short-lived that it. guilt or...? Oh, yeah, for about 10 minutes. Mm. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, it was... It but was of course, fun. you did get a first, so you're probably the one uh, on the pecking order. Well, you probably want to keep you, wouldn't you? I think it was the right time, right place. Okay. I'm being a bit glib there. But uh, <laughs> So um, what advice, uh, James, would you give to someone that's interested in starting a career in property, facilities management. I mean, obviously, your journey is quite unique. Mm -hmm. um, it's gone through a very formal process of uh, through the academic uh, route, and then working for some smaller companies, larger companies, and then becoming a, a co-founder of an organization of your own in that sort of entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. um, which is a good uh, for our listeners to hear, because I think that's quite unique in, in terms of the people that we've uh, had on the podcast, that particular route. So there is a, I would say, I'm not saying a way out, but there is a sort of a, a route there. What what advice would you give to those people? I think first and foremost, be open-minded. I think especially at a younger age, be uh, open to going and trying things and kind of understanding how it operates and what's involved in each different sort of faculty, if you like. Okay. Uh, I think people are too quick to go, I only want to be in this and I only want to do that. Yet they haven't actually experienced it, so they don't know what's involved. And I think that then narrows your opportunity as well because a lot of people will say, well, I'll just wait until the right opportunity comes along and mm. they're still sitting at home with the parents. Never happens. Yeah. So I think get out there, get involved in it, and then navigate towards the things that really interest you. I mean, I remember being at CBRE and thinking, well, this team isn't quite right for what I want to do. I've got an interest in kind of startups and business and kind of retail and brands. I was excited by that. And I sat on a beach in Miami kind of on a holiday, just making a note in a book of all the things that I enjoy doing. And now fast forward where we are 10 years later, we're doing 90% of that stuff as contour. But the only way I can do that is having experienced it myself. So to your point, I may have moved and chopped and changed quite a bit, but mm -hmm. I've had a, had an insight into facilities. I've had an insight into property management. I've done asset management. I've done leasing. I've done retail. I've done offices. I've done all different stuff that mm -hmm. touches, even residential right at the beginning as an estate agent, to know I like that. I don't like that. I won't yeah, do that. I would say that because you've worked with some large organizations, you've had the opportunity to move around sort of into departmentally to see what's the best fit for you mm. um, and to also gain those skill sets for becoming a business owner yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, of course, at the end of it, you can go back to Miami and lie on that beach as well and enjoy it. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, so how would you say, obviously, you've gone through uh, setting up your business at the moment and things, and you, you've been going solidly uh, with bits of blips and things like that over the last nine years. How um, has online meetings uh, changed in terms of your approach to business, in terms of facilities management, property engagement with those people? Mm. I, I think it's almost going full circle now. We're very much focused on personal interaction. Okay. And there's always a little bit that's lost through through virtual. Even though it's convenient, it's still a lot of it gets lost. And I think we're now starting to see the sort of uh, first sort of flourish again of people going, no, I only want to meet in person. Good. I'd rather not do it online if we can. Can you come for a coffee in London? Let's let's kind of get together. Because I think there's just so much more that comes out of it. So it's been a really useful tool. There's no getting around it. And I think going through that pandemic piece, it allowed us to keep the team together. Yeah. So from a morale point of view, we were having quizzes and doing all the stuff that everybody else was trying to do and keep people happy. But it was just more touching in with our clients and keeping keeping abreast of where they were. Um, but do I think it's something I would like to keep doing? We have a lot of US clients. We have to do it. I can't fly every time to go and see them and meet them. But if I could avoid it, I would. Okay. And um, and what role uh, do you see, um, you know, with the emergence of artificial intelligence playing in facilities management and your, let's say, your, your business? Uh, <laughs> we we set out on a bit of a journey post COVID, and we were trying to get quite clever with process and systems and putting in things that would shortcut the role, but also improve the client experience and make our brokers, our kind of agents who are transacting deals, more efficient. Okay. And what we actually found is it distanced ourselves further and further from our client, and it got less and less successful we as a business became less successful because of trying to get too smart and have 
uh, systems and processes in place like artificial intelligence. It's even we have a landing bot on our web page which effectively vets clients before we even talk to them. So they'll put in their parameters of what they want. They'll get asked a series of questions and it will spit out an answer. And then we then we'll reach out and contact them if they've met the criteria that we want to actually speak to them. It's a bit like a credit rating, really. Isn't a, it? a little bit, but it's putting barriers in place to an extent of going, well, actually, that client could be someone really interesting, but you don't know because the chatbot told you he's good or bad. Mm. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I think what I'm trying to say is I guess a lot of what we do is more art rather than science. So I don't want to lose that personal interaction with our clients. But I think there are definitely easy wins to improving the efficiency of what we do, producing interest schedules of people who are looking for space, mm. producing brochures, marketing material, whatever it might be to be- give to our clients to say, mm. these are all the available options that meet your criteria. I mean, when I started in the industry, we were sitting there, um, you know, go back right to the beginning, we'd receive a brochure through the post. And you'd scan it in and then you put them all together. And about three weeks later, you might then send a, a list of stuff to your client going, mm-hmm. here's everything that's available in the market. Then you get to CBRE and we used to get PDFs. And then you'd sit there getting the graduates to cut out effectively the picture and then put it onto a PowerPoint. And then probably two days later, you'd get one. Now we have a system where we effectively send it out to Singapore or somebody somewhere abroad. It gets turned around overnight and it comes back the next day. Mm-hmm fully fully done so it's getting more and more efficient and in, those are good things because the speed of your your work is getting quicker i think there's an element from a legal standpoint where i personally hate lawyers i think they earn too much money for just getting in the way um, having been through an mbo and, and an acquisition of a company recently it was painful because of the lawyers not because of the people who are involved in trying to bring those two businesses together so I think there's a lot in terms of leasing that computers could do better and, and they can take a lot of standardization of various lease terms and shortcut that legal process reducing the fees but also mainly reducing the arguments and ego ticks mm-hmm. for, for each of those lawyers on either side who tend to create the problems rather than the people who do yeah however you know james you, you in your business you're not going to get away with um not having lawyers cast their legal beagle eyes on those things and charge extortionate amounts of money no, um, no we, I, mean, uh, I think uh, only about three podcasts ago we were uh, interviewing a, a barrister on um, a human rights barrister or something so um, uh, we I did give him quite a uh, hard time on his shiny building in the city so um, but that's aside um, uh, another thing that I wanted to sort of ask you about I mean being a bit of a petrol head um is in your opinion how do environmental social governance issues impact your business um good question uh, sustainability and environmental issues are are a priority for our clients whether it be asset owners or for our tenants who are occupying space okay uh a lot of them are forcing and pushing that agenda and and making sure that it's very much front and center we're going through the process of becoming b corp ourselves at the moment okay um as as many of our kind of landlord occupier um asset owner clients are as well as indeed Um, hawkey are also going through that verification process at the moment and and i think i feel your pain yeah you know there's a there's a lot of work that has to be done i think we're quite fortunate because we don't run vehicles, we don't own real estate. There's a lot of stuff that we can kind of shortcut Mm. and score quite highly on. But but I think it's still a very useful thing to demonstrate that you care. Yes. To align yourselves with with that. But, uh, you know, I I, I think that's very laudable. But, uh, you know, you obviously got a a hobby Mm. that is a, you know, a big carbon footprint hobby yep. how do you kind of get around that bit well at the moment uh, it's the only thing that we can really well, it's also a business i should well, say uh, true and and the only thing we can do is carbon offset and do various other things but i think that's more of a token gesture okay so for me you know do you currently do that i do yeah okay yeah there's an organization we, we do excellent uh, and we try and try and get all the statistics from the teams that we work with as well so if we have a team that help run the car oh. we'll try and understand the mileage that they're doing the type of trucks and everything else they're working towards and try and build that into the calculation as well okay um but it starts at the top doesn't it to an extent and you look at formula one and you look at what they're doing they are biofuels and everything else that they're working on to try and maintain the spirit in the heart of what motor racing actually is and, mm-hmm. and, and combustion rather than electric and yeah. trying to do all that. And so. it, but also, I would say, add that it starts at the C-suite of which you're part of. So, I mean, what's good is that you do that, uh, you know, that offset and stuff. Is, is there any particular 
um, areas that you buy those credits for, for the carbon offset? Uh, normally around trees and schools okay. and various other bits. Okay. And uh, what do you, uh, what does the future of the landscape of um, you know facilities management property uh, uh, do you think look like? I think that's a fascinating question. It's it's evolving almost daily at the moment in terms of what we're seeing on the ground from ultimately the end consumer of the building, okay. which then employs everybody else around it to service and facilitate it. Yeah, um, is that they don't still quite understand how they want to consume the product. Uh, I think they know they want flexibility. They know they want it an ease of use. So they want it managed. They want it built out. There's a disconnect between the end consumer still and the owner of the asset. Yeah, it, It's historically been a 10-year lease in, in London and you fit it out as the occupier for what you want to use and there's no getting out of it and you're putting down large rent deposits and, and you're ultimately building something that may be ready now but won't be fit for purpose in five years' time because... Mm-hmm. We've gone through a pandemic and people only want to come in three days a week or whatever it might be. So we're sitting in a space at the moment that's built for flexibility it's to, to, to attract occupiers that are scaling and growing or even contracting. Um, and I think this is, to an extent, the future of how people want to consume at least office space for the time being. And, and I think we're we're mindful of, of trying to find those solutions for our occupiers as we go through. And we have clients who have gone from 12 desks to 200,000 square feet in four years mm. and then gone to Cardiff and Vegas and, and LA and various other markets and then have gone, oh, we don't have any funding anymore because of a banking crisis or a financial crisis. What do we do? And there's a load of redundant space. And then you've got landlords stripping out cat A's and various other things, chucking it in the skip two years later after it was almost brand new. That, for me, makes no sense. So mm-hmm. I think it's just we're trying to, to help inform asset owners and occupiers what is happening, how they can be more sustainable in terms okay. of how they fit out and use space. Um, but there still, for me, feels a big disconnect between the owner and the end user. So you think over the next sort of five years there's still progress and it's an evolving thing, ever-evolving um, okay. What five uh, key skills uh, do you believe are essential for anyone um, working in, uh, let's say, facilities management, property um, field? Uh, Just five. At the early stages of their career or all um, the way through? Yeah, I would say, at the, let's say, um, yeah, at the sort of formative stage. Yeah, well, I think we talk, touched on one earlier about just being open-minded and being yeah. prepared to look at everything. I think I'll give you that one. Tenacity to, to actually pursue options and opportunities. I think too many people are just prepared to sit back and wait for it to land on the lap. It, okay. it doesn't. You've, you've got to go and pursue it. You've got to be proactive. You've got to go and send out your CV and, and approach people and reach out on LinkedIn or whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the ability and the desire to continue to educate yourself you know, that can be done through listening to podcasts. It can be done by reading books and various other things. But again, it's something you've got to go and want to do. Uh, how many is that? Three? Ah, <laughs> uh, that's three. Right. Yep. I'm okay. Yep. Um, Give me two more. Remind me, remind me of what things would you recommend? Or What keys, uh, five key skills do you believe are essential for anyone working in uh, facilities management, property management field? Uh, articulate being able to communicate on multiple levels i think especially in facilities management okay you might have different stakeholders at different times you may have a, a plumber from east london you're dealing with at one minute and a property manager who's working for land securities on on the other and you need to be able to talk to them in slightly different ways to get the same message across um I'm struggling for a fifth but i can come back to you okay um and uh so what would you say are the common challenges today you face in uh, 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 the property field and how do you overcome them? I think redundancy of space is a big challenge at the moment. Okay. Uh, and that impacts in rate many different ways. Obviously, there's an EPC rating coming in, yeah. um, which is going to challenge and push landlords to improve their product. We're already seeing a bit of a flight to quality. Um, occupiers are typically taking less space but paying more for it. So their net spend on real estate hasn't necessarily changed, but they're taking better quality space. You can see that in the city. You can see that in the West End with real estate prices uh, actually increasing since Mm -hmm. COVID, which seems counterintuitive to me. But so the net effect of rents are are sort of decreasing because the incentives they're getting are less, but they're having to pay more for higher quality stock. 
So there's very few buildings that actually meet the right criteria. Because mm. so. we are seeing a lot of um, sort of dead space in certainly in the West End. Um, in this area, obviously in Hoban and stuff, it's a lot of co-working and things like that, and a lot of these buildings are taken up, but there's still a, a hell of a lot of dead space in the West End. There is, and I, I think there's a lot of work going on with fit-out contractors, design and build companies, where they're very busy at the moment. And that is predominantly led by landlords trying to refurbish space to make it more attractive to yeah. occupiers. The problem they'll probably find in six months' time is there aren't as many occupiers as they think there are, to take space and we're seeing that from our demand our demand is down probably 20 or 30 percent on where it was last year coming out of covid and i think there's going to be a struggle that may in turn then reduce some of that pricing accordingly okay um and what uh challenges are face are you faced with obviously as a business owner um in terms of recruitment retention and recognition of your workforce oh that's a great question. That is a great question. There's many facets to that one. Uh, we've been through a bit of a period in the last 12 months of recruiting staff. Being okay. A headache. How many, to, sorry, in terms so of headcount you are? We're 25 at the moment. Okay. Um, so 25 and we have been adding, we added four in the last 12 months. Okay. But we've had to compete heavily on remuneration, package in general to attract the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was a bit of a mad rush um, coming out of, of the kind of COVID uh, piece and that in turn led to some overinflated salaries but we've had to pay them to attract the right people mm -hmm. um, and, and that obviously in turn will squeeze our margins because I don't think our turnover has dramatically increased. In fact, talking about that 20% drop in yeah. demand is actually made us probably less profitable to have the right people in place. But mm -hmm. we're doing that because we're growing. That's, You're on that's that climb point. back, aren't you? We are, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the first bit, is there's definitely been a struggle recruiting talent. Uh, the second bit is everyone expects the world, and they have very little experience. So there's kind of an overinflated junior ego that seems to exist in our industry at the moment, which... Um, it is again a misalignment that I think they need to do some of the hard yards to then justify their. I couldn't their possibly cost. comment. <laughs> um, what else? I think it's harder to do and keep people in the office and create culture, okay. and maintain culture. Because James, your office is based. So we're in Fitzrovia, so Rathbone Place. Okay, so you have an, a core hub where you work from and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So okay. we, we signed up a uh, five-year lease once we came out of COVID there. We've, we're committed to the West End. We're committed to growing into that space. Okay. And in terms of your uh, retention of your existing workforce, have you found that a, a challenge? No. Uh, we've been really fortunate. We've had one person leave in 10 years. Okay. And they wanted to go on a career break and travel around the world. So okay. I, I look at that as a really positive view that we must have been doing something right that's not to say we can rest on our laurels and just go oh everyone will stay forever but we we did a management buyout as i said my business partner has actually left the business now okay. and taken over fully um, through their own through yeah through their own through their choice. own desire. we actually looked at it post covid and said look these are the things we need to do to continue to grow we wanted to branch into asset owner advisory landlord advisory of kind of marketing of assets mm. and uh he agreed that that was absolutely the right thing to do. But after 10 years of growing and building a business, coming out of COVID, some personal matters, he just went, I don't have the energy or the enthusiasm for it. I want to go and do angel investment. I want to go and do other things. Okay. So, so we agreed an exit package for him. But what that's allowed me to do is, one, uh, incentivize the management team around us. So, again, talking about that retention piece, mm -hmm. that allows me to say, actually, guys, you know, you've been here nine years. You deserve a piece of this pie and to be part of it. We had options for for some of them way back okay i've now converted those options into actual equity and then we've given equity to some of the other key staff as well who have been there for seven eight nine years continually improved the business continually improved our process and systems but also contributed financially to the revenue of, of where we got to so it felt like the right time to reward them it also felt like the right time to swap out one business partner and bring in nine others which in itself brings management headache and ego and personality, but relieves some of the pressure that sits completely squarely on my shoulders. So it felt like the right thing to do for me. So wait a minute. So just just for me to process that, you went from two business partners and now you've got nine. Correct. Yeah. So the decision-making process is out of that, you've got a workforce of 20-odd. 
25, yeah. Um, is very challenging. It, it is, but everyone knows their role within the organization. Everyone's pretty defined in terms of what's expected from them. But they've all come from very different elements of the industry. And I think that in itself creates almost a board of, of kind of directors that have a very unique view on the individual personalities, but also the greater success of the whole. So Seems like a bit of a John Lewis model, doesn't it? Well, I'm not going to go that far. I'm not going to start giving everybody uh, options and, and equity. It has to be to be earned. But I think we can get, as long as there's a, a rigid set of parameters of how okay. decisions are made, and I still have a special majority, which means I can overrule everything. Uh, so it means we, you know, although it's a, a cooperative to an extent, it's also a dictatorship. Okay. Um, and that, I mean, we, we talked about re, um, recruitment, retention. So what about recognition for... Um, we're talking of all members of the workforce. How how's that sort of um, cascaded? Yeah, um, and again, uh, no no real issues with that. I mean, most of our our team are effectively salespeople. Okay, so they have paid a basic salary. They get private healthcare. They get pension schemes. They get everything that they require to do their job. But they're also commission based, so they're eating what they kill to an extent. So there's never any real issues around remuneration. They're pretty happy with that. The ones that aren't, that are more of a core function, so it could be our head of finance or head of operations, they're incentivized on various KPIs and then paid a bonus that we pre-agree at the beginning of the year, subject to them hitting it. Um, that's worked reasonably well, and we've promoted from within. We've very rarely had to go out and promote above someone who's already in the organization. We try and encourage those around us. We send in graduates um, on uh, conversion courses to do real estate, masters to then become okay. chartered surveyors. We're so you've got a couple of graduates already in, in the we do. in the organization. Yep, okay. and we, we put them through their, their RSCS membership as well. So we've kind of done that whole, whole sort of cradle's grave piece. We continue to lead training with, with our kind of senior staff and they're always away doing various other things to okay. improve and, and grow. Uh, I mean, that's, that, that is very good. Um, and so now I want to just sort of go into a little bit of a nosedive into your uh, what your greatest achievements have been in your career um, to date. Uh, my first achievement was leaving CBRE and taking the leap to set up on my own. And that's nothing against the the big corporate organizations. That's just personally having candidly the balls to do it. Yeah. Um, I think it's a big leap. How old were you at that stage? I was 28 at that point. Okay. So it was pretty fresh. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of learning that went on, but I had a lot of people around me who believed in what I was doing and, and gave us opportunities to go and prove it. And mm -hmm. we, we worked super hard to make sure that that happened. And I take it very personally if something goes wrong. So mm -hmm. you're always constantly trying to... To, to resolve anything that ever did go wrong. And we we're fairly fortunate that it didn't really. Okay. Um, so from that point of view, I think just having having that mindset of going and be able to do it opened up so much in the head in terms of what you could go and achieve. The second one was navigating COVID and coming out of it arguably stronger. Yeah. I think we took quite a, uh, not an ax to the business, but we certainly looked at it in fine detail and kind of realized there was quite a lot of fat we were carrying in terms of various departments, in terms of our marketing spend and various spending within the business. So you, you sort of kind of pivoted very, very quickly during that period? Uh, to an extent, yeah. Um, we, we kind of looked at our fee model and tried to change that to make sure that it was kind of reoccurring and on a monthly basis rather than transactional. You know, that helped from a cash flow point of view, um, but also looked at our costs and realized we didn't need to spend as much as we were to make the same dollar if that makes okay. sense. Um, so, we, yeah, again, that was an exercise where we had to really look quite deeply into ourselves and into the business mm -hmm. and go, actually, do we need this? No. Um, so, again, I'm quite proud of the way that we came out of that without having to make major redundancies, without having to fundamentally change the business mm -hmm. or give up. And I think that's the kind of one thing I'm really proud of is that no matter how tough it keeps getting, we keep cracking on and we keep turning up and we keep getting on with it. Yeah, there's a remarkable resilience there. Um, so that's the positives. So conversely, on the flip side, do you have any regrets in your career, um, whether it's in the facilities management, property management sort of field? Regrets, no, because I think everything I've done has led me to here. 
not in this room with you. I mean, obviously, it's a great pleasure to be here. Delighted to have you. <laughs> um, but but here in terms of kind of career progress today, I think at 37 to be sitting here running a business that turns over 5 million quid with an organization and a workforce that has good retention, hopefully has very good feedback from our clients, I'm remarkably proud of. So I don't think there's any major regrets. Should I have done it quicker? Ideally, yes, I should have done, but would I have had the contacts or the experience to do it? Probably not. So it was the. Well, so you're time. suggesting you should have done it before 28? Uh, I'm not saying to those listening that that should be what you should do. I think you should gain your experience and go and do the hard yards. I just wish I'd kind of taken the blinkers off a little bit earlier and explored more opportunity than just focused on one thing. Um, so that's a slight regret. I think I also regret not telling people how I genuinely feel about things sometimes okay i'm a bit of a people pleaser so let's let's explore that a little bit more what what do you mean by that uh i think as in the early days of being a graduate i assumed that it was absolutely right to work 12 hours a day and carry people's bags and do all their their homework basically because that's how you get through it right and and i think at some point you go well enough's enough i'm the one getting burnt out here for somebody else's gain because they're in the pub so but you did get a first Keep bringing that up. Um, <laughs> it's it's one of those. It's, com- it's commendable. <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. Normally, most people who got first or something were never in the student bar or anything in my <laughs> my university. So, yeah. I mean, were you boring? No, no. I didn't. I didn't stop doing anything. That okay. Was, well, you're naturally fun. exceptionally bright. No, I just found something that I enjoyed doing. Okay. I think that was the, that was the secret to it. I was learning about something that actually excited me, uh, rather than trying to trawl through something that I felt like I needed to do but didn't necessarily want to do. Um, but yeah, I should have told more people to go away in the politest sense. Right. Uh, and I think that's even true now. I'm still too keen to try and appease clients, try and go that extra yard for them when actually what they're asking for isn't what the market is, but doesn't exist. And I need to be firmer with them and just say, no, that, that's not possible. I can demonstrate that because of X, Y, and Z. We're not going to do that. And still we go through this little slight pussyfooting around trying to please them and stroke their ego when actually I think they'd appreciate me just being a bit firmer. So, James, would you say you find it hard to say no to clients? I have historically. I think I'm getting better at it as I've been forced to now rather than wanting to. The, the amount of work that I now have, whether it's sitting here running that business, being involved in other consultancy roles that I have for other people's businesses, or being involved in the racing, just okay. means I simply don't have the time. Okay. So I have to say no, otherwise I'm going to drown. Okay. And finally, um, what things in life, it could be work, leisure, gives you the greatest satisfaction and enjoyment? Uh, two two things obviously we touched about on the racing right that is my one true kind of passion outside of work that, that I get very excited about for the three weeks before I actually go racing uh, I think anybody who's kind of been involved in it and does it knows that it's a bit of an infatuation that you have to either love or you, you don't put your energy and time and money into it so so that's a really welcome uh, distraction from everything I do and something I really really love doing I have a wife, I have a dog, uh, hopefully in due course we'll have a family and I'm, I'm really enjoying that kind of phase of my life now. It's, again, being forced to turn off the computer. I could very easily go home and keep working. Okay, because it's your own business, obviously. Because it's my so own business that, and there's always something else you can do and there's always an extra an email you can send, but my wife sits there and goes, oi, pay attention to me now, we're doing this. So I welcome that. And the dog gets a walk, I guess, as well. Oh, he's mega. Yeah, he loves it. He's, uh, yeah, he's a Bedlington Whippet who wrote these at literally 100 miles an hour but uh 10 minutes on the heath at hampstead heath and then he's done for the rest of the day he comes into the office with me every day so that's great that i mean that's that's that is also very um encouraging because it's a uh, uh, people everybody likes to pat the dog and stuff like that and it's good for we we have in a lot of co-working spaces people bringing dogs in and things so it's an it's the new norm yeah i mean of our 25 staff we've got seven dogs so oh, really? You have to have a rotation policy if you're only having two in at a time, otherwise it's chaos. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, well, um, well, thank you, James. Um, thank you very much for that. That's uh, our 17th episode of Wear Many Hats uh, podcast. Um, we hope that uh, our listeners have found this interesting. I certainly have. And we'd like to thank James for taking the chair today. Um, it's been both uh, thought-provoking, engaging, and we welcome uh, the feedback from our listeners um, in due course. Thank you once again. My pleasure. Thank you.